Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Well, Hawaii is no paradise if you are in critical need of medical care. That was the title of my article, or at least close to it, Hawaii is no paradise if you need medical care, in the weekend's edition of Wall Street Journal on December 3rd. There I mentioned that even before the pandemic, Hawaii needed 800 additional doctors and about 2,200 non-physician personnel. That was just to meet the needs at that time. But our high taxes and high regulations have driven medical workers from the state and have limited our health care policy, and so have some regulatory practices that we're going to talk a little bit about today. However, I want to introduce to you now somebody who knows this work because she's actively involved in advocating for health care for the residents of Hawaii, and in particular Hawaii Island. Uh, today, we've got again on our program Lisa Rance, the executive director of the Hilo Medical Center Foundation. And according to Lisa, residents of Hawaii Island are voicing their concerns now about the shortage in health care. Maybe you've known of people from the neighbor islands and the Big Island in particular who've had to wait months in order to see a specialist and then have had to fly to Oahu to do so, or sometimes e even less availability to them. Well, Lisa is currently currently conducting a very important survey of residents about access to health care on the Hawaii Island. And so I'm just very pleased today that we can dive a little deeper into this issue with Lisa. Welcome to the program. Lisa, you've been executive director over there at Hilo Medical Center Foundation since 2014, I, I believe. And uh, I want to welcome you back. Glad to have you back on the program today. Thank you so much, Kalehi. I'm always a pleasure to be on your show and spread the word about um, what we need to do to make things better. Well, you're doing very important work. And uh, as you and I were chatting just before the program, I have to confess that five to 10 years ago, uh, very rarely did I hear people talk about the shortage of medical need in Hawaii. Uh, I knew of it somewhat. Uh, statistically, I knew of certain issues and concerns. But living on the island of Oahu, where we seemed to have all the medical care that we need, we weren't aware of how acutely the problem existed for our neighbor island friends. And uh, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, the, the many, many stories that I've heard through the years of neighbor islanders having to wait and wait and wait to get medical care, it seems as though the problem is getting worse. Would you say that there has been a lack of awareness of this problem and, and now we're starting to learn more about it? Yeah, I think that, you know, there's been efforts like the Hawaii, the annual Hawaii Physician Workforce Assessment that's been banging this drum for the last 11 years and, you know, really trying to highlight the shortages that are taking place on the neighbor islands, but out of sight, out of mind, right? So with your population base on Oahu and not having shortages on Oahu, you don't know what that's like. You don't know what it feels like. You don't want to know what it's like to have to receive cancer care but be told that you can't get it on island and you have to travel either to Oahu or the mainland to get care and then not feel very good and then have to travel back home. And that takes you away from your support base, your family, your comfort of your own home. Uh, I think as um, we've seen more neighbor island folks getting care on Oahu as our shortages increase across the neighbor islands, we're starting to feel that on Oahu. And when you call your doctor and they're like, oh, you can't get in for two weeks or we can't see you for three weeks because, you know, we have appointments from neighbor island community members, then all of a sudden it hits home. And I think right. as the shortage increases. We're starting to see more uh of the impact on Oahu. Lisa, I would agree with you that on Oahu, we're becoming more aware of the plight of our neighbor island uh, neighbors with respect to health care availability. Uh, but we're also starting to realize now that this is not just a rural or neighbor island problem. It is a statewide shortage of medical personnel and facilities that we have. In fact, in my opening comments, I mentioned that we had a clear-cut shortage even before the pandemic. And going into it, and during the pandemic, we've become all the more aware of how critical our shortage is here in Hawaii. Uh, be before we continue, I, I just want to take a moment and ask you to share a little bit about your background in terms of being what, what you call yourself today and what I observe you to be, a healthcare advocate and educator. 
Uh, absolutely. Um, so I, I was actually a teacher before I um, joined uh, Hilo Medical Center Foundation. And my first um, task was to build out the community arm of the foundation, which involved support for the Hawaii Island Family Medicine Residency Program, the only residency program located outside of Oahu. And it became very clear that we had to work on the infrastructure to make it possible to hire physicians in the community with getting a health profession shortage area designation or a HIPSA, which allows for loan repayment which if you want younger providers to take over existing practices of aging providers, you need that loan repayment because education is very expensive now. And then that also provided a 10% bonus payment to our physicians in practice for all of the direct billed Medicare services, which is intended to help increase that Medicare rate, which we have the lowest in the nation here in mm. Hawaii. But Hawaii's done a great job at getting everybody health insurance, but having health insurance does not equate to having access to health care. Well, I appreciate all of the advocacy you are doing in that regard. Um, you, you mentioned to me that you had seen my article in Wall Street Journal this weekend, the one entitled Hawaii is no paradise if you need medical care. I, any thoughts uh, on that? Did, did we dovetail on some of the observations you've made over the last few years? Absolutely. You um, reported on the nursing study that showed that Hawaii County has the third largest shortage in our nation, followed by Maui County at number five and Kauai at number 13. But if you look at number one and number two, they're in areas that are very close to metropolis areas or populated areas where you can drive. In Hawaii, we're rural and remote, and we cannot drive. We have to fly to get health care. And so really talking with our congressional delegation, as well as our state legislators on working on efforts where we can actually move the needle, right? It's one thing to report that we have these shortages and they go up. So even from your article, it's gone up to 1,008 from 820 is what our current shortage is for the state. So um, that's pretty significant. <laughs> well, the fact that we have a medical, capacity shortage is something that figured prominently in the rationale uh, by our government leaders for many of the lockdowns and some of the re restrictions that we've been ex we experienced and are continuing to experience in, in the um, pandemic. In fact, uh, there has been the specter described of overrunning our medical facilities. So in terms of as clearly as, as possible that for us to understand, uh, what is the medical sh shortage here in Hawaii and how severe is it? Well, as I just stated, you know, just for physicians, we're short over a thousand um, providers. We have the most acute primary care shortage in the nation. Um, and we also have a nursing shortage. And so when you couple that, you know, we have legislators that have told us, you know, hey, you know, if we don't have primary care providers, we can have nurse practitioners or physician assistants come in and provide primary care and preventative care. But the bottom line is we have a shortage on all of those things. And it's very hard to fill those positions, especially specialty positions, which we found during COVID. Um, you don't have respiratory therapists. We don't have the critical um, infrastructure that we need in our healthcare system. We have the least amount of beds in our hospital system per Per capita in the nation. And that's why we had to lock down because there just wasn't the capacity to deal with the surge because we're already on a regular day to day basis running a very high census, especially since so many um, folks paused their care during COVID. And now they're going in because they're sicker and they need more acute attention than they did ahead of the pandemic. So it's it's just um, a difficult situation. Well, we've talked about what the problem is, but why does it exist? Uh, how did this happen here in the state of Hawaii? And uh, what are the factors that have contributed to the shortage? We like to refer to that as the perfect storm. <laughs> we have a high cost of living. 
our students, when they go into medical careers, come out with an exorbitant amount of debt and to look at the housing costs as well. So, I mean, that goes into the cost of living, but electricity is higher, food prices are higher, and then the reimbursements are the lowest in the nation. So you make less money and have higher bills. It's difficult to recruit young folks here. And then you've got parents that have lived here you know, maybe families for generations. And every generation wants the next generation to do better than the one before. And I think we're facing the first generation who's going to do worse than their parents did. And so I think parents recognize that and they're actually telling their kids to stay on the mainland, get their loans paid off, buy a nice big house, raise your kids. And then as the parents get older, then you can move back home and you can help take care of me. But what we're actually seeing is that these folks are moving and they want to be closer to their grandkids. We're losing population in the state of Hawaii. And healthcare is one of the largest reasons why. When you talk about the exodus of people out from the state of Hawaii, uh, you, you mentioned many of the factors such as the cost of living, which includes, of course, the cost of housing uh, and so forth. And not only that, the, the difficulty of carrying the kinds of educational loans that are needed to go into the medical profession. What do you think the, the solution would be to this? I, I mean, and let's start at a, a more ground level point of view in terms of future practitioners of, of, of the medical arts here in Hawaii, future doctors, future nurses, and so forth. Is there anything we can be doing now to help encourage them and empower them to stay in the state of Hawaii? Absolutely. Or return I, to the state of Hawaii. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, community members are exceedingly grateful for health care. Uh, when we recruited a cardiologist two years ago, he said that he was thanked more in the first two weeks of being at Hilo Medical Center than he was in 10 years of practice on the mainland. And you know, I think that gratitude goes a long way, but we can only work for pleases and thank yous for so long. Um, many of our providers, because the Medicare rate is so low, lose money on Medicare patients. So they need that commercial payer mix. One way to fix that is um, working through the congressional delegation to try to get an increase in the Medicare rates, something on par with Alaska. If we are successful in doing that, what I've been told is then um, our commercial rates will go up because the commercial rates are based off of that Medicare rate. And that's bad for business and that's bad for individuals adding to the cost of living. Another option is something that the state can control and that would be relief from the general excise tax. The general excise tax is a gross receipts tax and the hospitals don't pay it nonprofits don't pay it, which means our federally qualified health centers providing care to some of the most vulnerable are not burdened with that. But our community physicians that are at the front lines of caring for our Medicare patients, for our MedQuest patients, TRICARE, our veterans, right? They're not allowed or they're not able, they can't afford to take on those patients because they have to pay that tax. They can't pass that tax on to that, those populations. Now, Lisa, that may be a little bit difficult for the average person to understand because, first of all, the GET that you're talking about, general excise tax, doesn't sound like it's all that much. It's a tack on 4 to 5% in, in most of our eyes, something we do when we pay groceries. So I've met a lot of people who find it very difficult to believe that this can be a make or break issue for medical doctors. But as I've listened to doctors, those that are not employed by big corporations who have their own practices and have to maintain their own businesses. The GET along with the rate of um, reimbursement for Medicare combine in a very big way. Uh, apparently they've got, they have a very small margin they make and so the GET and Medicare rate take a huge bite out of that. Is, is that how that works? 
it is. And so being a gross receipts tax, it doesn't um, equate to 4.5%. It's more like 15 to 20% of a practice cost. And when you're looking at a margin, a uh, typical practice, 70% overhead, 30% um, is what they make on the margin, but they have to pay at least half of that in the general excise tax from what we've read on the research and looking at the analysis. Um, it just um, makes it very difficult to be a viable practice with the higher cost of living. We actually just lost three providers um, here in East Hawaii on Hawaii Island that are closing up their doors and moving to the mainland uh, because they can't make the numbers work. They just can't do it anymore. Hmm. Well, you know, that, that's fascinating and also tragic uh, because I think very few people have any idea as to how hard it is for somebody trying to make a living in the medical profession to do so. And so what you've provided to, to us is information that's very insightful. When we come back from a, a quick break, I'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit about the survey that you are conducting uh, that will give us some insights in to the problems that our people are facing. So I'm going to come back in just a moment with Lisa Rance, um, Executive Director of the Medical Hilo Medical Center Foundation, and you'll be with us on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Don't go away. I'm Christine Linders, physical therapist and board certified orthopedic clinical specialist. And I am the host of Movement Matters, a show that is designed to bring you the best physical therapy tips and exercises so that you can have your best body and do all the things that you love. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 11 a.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, where I show you instructional videos from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes to get your body feeling its best. Remember, life is better when you listen to your physical therapist. I'll see you on Tuesday. Welcome back to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm here with Lisa Rance. Uh, we're discussing a very important issue, the shortage of health care in Hawaii. And, and she's done a marvelous job of advocating for that, not only on Hawaii Island, but statewide. She's the executive director of the Hilo Medical Center Foundation. Lisa, you've got a project going on now, which is a survey to determine uh, access to health care in Hawaii, what people's perceptions of that is, and, and what the reality is about that. It'll be very important. Uh, I understand it began on the Big Island, but it's actually turned into a statewide project. Would you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I would be happy to. So um, it's a comprehensive community health needs assessment, and we it, it was always intended to be a statewide um, project. We wanted to start it on Hawaii Island because that's where the most acute shortages are. We have a 53% shortage of providers or 200 and 287 according to the Hawaii Physician Workforce Assessment. And plus, um, I'm president for Hawaii State Rural Health Association and our office is in uh, Hawaii, I, on Hawaii Island. And so it just um, made sense to start here since the nursing shortage also indicated that uh, Hawaii County is number three in the nation. So what this is, is we are, um, we actually just wrapped up the survey. We did a community survey asking community members if they can get care when they need it. Uh, if they can't get care, uh, what care are they um, not able to get? Do they have to fly to Oahu or do they have to go to the mainland to get that care? And then HMSA is also sharing their uh, data with us as far as what's being flown off island by procedure code. So we'll be able to start triangulating this data to show um, exactly what our shortages are and what we need to recruit for. 
And the other thing, which is um, sort of unprecedented in these kind of assessments, is we've pulled providers together, um, physicians and nurses, et cetera, um, and asked them, what do they need to continue to be able to provide care in our rural communities? What's working well? What supports could maybe the insurance companies, our uh, policymakers, and community members provide to them so that we can continue to have access to care close to home? And so there was also a provider survey that went along with that. And what we're seeing in the initial results out of Hawaii Island is patients are having a hard time getting care. And the providers are saying that, you know, some patients, especially new patients, are at least a month out from getting any sort of um, appointment. And if it's something acute, they refer them to the emergency room to get that service. Um, so, and the other piece that we're seeing is the cost of care. Community members are postponing care because they get the bill that has the tax that's being passed on from the providers, and they're unsure as far as the co-pays and um, what that tax is, and it prevents our most vulnerable populations from going and getting that scan that can diagnose their cancer early. It's very unfortunate. Hmm. The survey is sponsored by what organization and uh, who's paying for, for it to get done? So this um, came out of monies from the Biden administration. So this was a CDC, a Center for Disease Control grant that went to the Department of Health. And so we worked very closely with the Office of Primary Care and Rural Health. And so we're doing all of the islands. We're starting in Hawaii Island and then in the first uh, quarter of 2022, we'll be launching simultaneously on the other islands with the focus groups and the surveys. We are working very closely with Hawaii State Rural Health Association, the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center, the um, County of Hawaii, we'll loop in the other counties um, in the first quarter, and uh, Community First, which was started by Barry Taniguchi in 2015 to address um, some of these issues that we've been talking about today. And so we um, contracted with Community First as the lead organization to help push this forward, um, because obviously Hilo Medical Center Foundation is very Hawaii Island centric, and we really couldn't take the lead on that, but Community First is a wonderful organization doing great work. Um, they have the R. Kuleana project that was started just ahead of the pandemic to, you know, get folks to, you know, take responsibility, wear masks, do the hand washing, um, et cetera. So uh, this is an important partnership as we move across the state. Well, obviously, one of the aims of the study will be to generate an aware, a greater awareness of the need for increasing health care resources in Hawaii, and hopefully that will result in more funding in, in that regard. Exactly. But so this, I'm sorry to interrupt you, this is just the first step. Yeah. So this assessment is just phase one, and then we're going to be able to report it out and then bring it back to the key stakeholders so that we can create that action plan. Where are the low hanging fruits? Are there policy changes that can be made that can, you know, start moving this needle forward? Because we, we can't just keep reporting. We need to take action and the time for action is now. We've seen it during the pandemic and we need to move this forward. It's just, there's just no way around it. And so we actually have a commitment of some small funding from some donors. Um, the Department of Health has a little bit of money to start helping move this forward. So this is going to um, hopefully help our uh, state legislators as they go into this session to know what to do with the monies that they've received from the federal government. Well, that's good. Lisa, uh, we get questions from time to time from, from viewers, and the following question just came in, and it indicates that those who may suffer from a shortage of health care uh, services and resources are not just our local residents. Here's the question. What do you think will happen it to Hawaii tourism if the legislature does not address the provider shortage crisis in the immediate future? Interesting question. 
yeah, and I, I think that if people knew how danger it, what dangerous it was to be here, if you suffer a trauma hiking, there's no trauma helicopters on Hawaii Island. You know, we have um, people that come to visit and they think that they're going to have a great time, but we see people drown. We have um, visitors that suffer cardiac arrest. There's just, um, I think, the big push to say that, you know, Hawaii is the safest place to travel um, is a misnomer, right? Um, we don't have the services to support the tourism industry. We need to be looking at other industries to step up to be able to fill in that gap. And perhaps instead of putting the burden of the general excise tax on our private practice folks, we look at reverting that back to you know, 1931, the reason why they started the sales tax, they didn't have a big enough base. And so we have a tourism base that comes in. We should be able to do something with that. I'm not an expert in that, but. <laughs> well, your thinking is in the right direction, however. Uh, at the Grassroot Institute, we have been advocating for removing the GET from medical and food as well and that's the direction most states are heading so we've got some catching up to do to say the least uh, very, very briefly uh, there are some regulations in our state that also impact the availability of health care one of them is a certificate of need uh, requirement any quick thoughts on that and if you could define that for our, our viewers yeah so I um I don't deal directly with the Certificate of Need or the SHIPTA organizations. We're actually um, working a little bit on um, the Hawaii County um, organization that, that does the Certificate of Needs to help with some videos to help our community members navigate the healthcare system. And that was kind of my first foray into the Certificate of Need, but then listening to their process of um, how they sort of decide whether we have the economies of scale or the population to add services um, was interesting to me. Um, I don't know enough about it to really make um, a large comment on the certificate of need process, but what I've read is um, it's a little bit antiquated and the federal government doesn't fund it. So this was a little bit from your article and um, yeah, it just seems like another layer of bureaucracy that may not be um, in the best interest of our community members getting access to the high quality care close to home that they deserve. Well, Lisa, I want to thank you so much for being on the program with us today. Uh, the things you've shared are very important. We need to be talking about them. And uh, I really appreciate the work that you're doing and looking forward to the results of the survey. Absolutely. We're looking forward to sharing the results. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Lisa Rance has been uh, my, my guest today. She is the executive director of the Hilo Medical Center Foundation, and we thank her so much for her insights. I'm Kili'i Akina with Hawaii uh, Today, I mean Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Aloha.